Welcome back. Let's begin with prayer. Our gracious Father, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you for the living word, Jesus Christ, that he's come to us, that he's spoken to us, that uh, he has sent his spirit to guide and lead those who wrote the scriptures. We pray for that spirit to guide us as we seek to understand them more deeply. We pray that you would teach us, conform us to the image of your son, and that uh, through all this, uh, Jesus Christ would be honored and glorified. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. I did want to say a few things about the um, uh, comments I was making at the conclusion of my session this morning, uh, which was talking about uh, the Old Testament, uh, not only as a set of foreshadowings, kind of isolated foreshadowings of what was to come in Christ, but also as having a certain narrative or historical pressure trajectory toward the final, uh, God's final act of redemption. And uh, I had pointed out a number of things that the Old Testament teaches us that lead, lead us to expect something going to happen, uh, something is going to happen uh, to, uh, to resolve Israel's um, dilemma, the kind of inconclusive conclusion that we have to the Old Testament story. Uh, one of those was God's own identification with Israel. He has given himself to Israel. He's bound himself to Israel with promises. He's taken a, taking oaths to, uh, that he will keep his promises. He's taken the name of Israel into his own name so that he identifies himself with Israel <clears throat> and bound his own name and his own reputation uh, among the nations to the fate of Israel. So if, if Israel fails, then uh, there's good reason to think that the God of Israel has failed. Uh, but he's not going to let that happen. So we know that he'll do something, a God who's made that kind of commitment and has that, the kind of power that the God of Israel has shown is going to do something to uh, redeem his people. Uh, he's going to do it by coming close to Israel. He's with Israel. He's God for Israel and he's God with Israel. He's Emmanuel. And so we expect some kind of uh, advent God drawing near to his people in order to redeem us. The point that I wanted to elaborate a little bit more on was the last, and that is that uh, we've already been introduced to a God of Israel who suffers at the rebellion and defiance and sin of his people. I read one passage that indicates that, uh, Psalm 78, verses 40 and 41, which talks about, the, it's talking about the rebellion of Israel in the wilderness and how that pained the Lord and grieved him. Uh, the, more, the most dramatic expressions of this are, are found in the prophecy of Jeremiah, where there are a number of places where the Lord, um, I should say the prophet, begins a lament, uh, and then it seems to shift into a divine lament, and it becomes difficult to unravel who is speaking the lament. Is it Yahweh himself who's lamenting? Is it the prophet who's lamenting? The two voices get uh, intertwined with each other. Uh, and uh, perhaps the most striking example of this is in um, Jeremiah 48, uh, where the Lord is uh, mourning, not over Israel, strikingly, but is mourning over uh, Moab and the um, sufferings of a Gentile nation. So uh, Jeremiah 48, uh, beginning in verse 28. Leave the cities and dwell among the crags, O inhabitants of Moab, and be like a dove that nests beyond the mouth of the chasm. We have heard the pride of Moab. He is very proud of his haughtiness, his pride, his arrogance, and his self-exaltation. I know his fury, declares the Lord, but it is futile. His idle boasts have accomplished nothing. There's a, a condemnation of Moab's uh, anger and Moab's pride. And the Lord in, says that the, the uh, boasts of Moab will, won't be accomplished. He won't be able to make good on those boasts. So uh, there's no idea here that the Lord is um, soft peddling the sins of Moab, uh, that he's uh, somehow uh, ignoring Israel's, uh, uh, Moab's fail failures. Uh, but then in the next verse, we have this. Therefore, I shall wail for Moab. Even for all Moab shall I cry out. I will moan for the people, for the men of Kir Heres. More than the weeping of Jazer, I shall weep for you, O vine of Sidma. Sidma. 
Your tendrils stretch out across the sea. They reach to the sea of Jazer. Upon your summer fruits and your grape harvest, the destroyer has fallen. So gladness and joy are taken away from the fruit, fruitful field uh, and from the land of Moab. And I have, made the wine, I have made the wine to cease from the wine presses. No one will tread them with shouting. The shouting will not be shouts of joy. Uh, verse 35, the Lord continues to speak. I will make an end of Moab, declares the Lord. The one who offers sacrifice on the high place, the one who burns incense to his gods. The Lord is going to judge Moab. Then, therefore, my heart wails for Moab like flutes. My heart also wails for Moab, for the men of Kirharis. Therefore, they have lost their abundance. For every head is bald and every beard cut short. There are gashes on all the hands and a sackcloth on the loins. On the, all the household, housetops of Moab and in the streets, there is lamentation everywhere. For I have broken Moab like an undesirable vessel, declares the Lord. So who is, who is mourning over Moab? Um, several places where it says something, the, the Lord declares something. And then without a break, there's somebody speaking in a first person. I shall wail for Moab. I will lament for Moab. Uh, it's not identified specifically as the Lord, but if you just follow the, uh, the logic of the, uh, of the passage, um, especially in verse uh, 33, where the, uh, sur surely the Lord is speaking. I have made the wine to cease from the vine. No one will tread with shouting. The shouting will, uh, will, will not be with shouts. Of, the shouting will not be shouts of joy. That has to be the Lord speaking. He's the one who's going to end the joy of Moab. But just before that, he's been lamenting over Moab. He's causing distress to Moab by bringing them under judgment. At the same time, he's mourning over them. And that seems to be the same uh, kind of sequence that we have in verses 35 and following, where there's an, uh, the announcement of the Lord's judgment of Moab and then the Lord's own uh, pain over the suffering of Moab. Uh, that's a, a remarkable passage in a lot of ways, not least because the Lord is the one who causes the suffering and yet also is lamenting over it. Uh, and because, of course, this is the Lord lamenting for a Gentile people. Uh, the Moabites are not entirely separated from Israel, of course. They're geographically very close to Israel, just on the east side of the Jordan. Uh, and the Moabites and the Ammonites were descended from uh, a relative of Abraham, Lot, uh, the Moabites were incorporated to some degree into uh, Israel and, in fact, into the royal family. Of course, Ruth is a Moabitess who is uh, incorporated into the descent, into the line of Judah that leads to King David. Uh, so this is not entirely, it's kind of a halfway between Gentile, fully Gentile and fully Israel. But the Lord is uh, showing this kind of passion um, and pity for uh, a people that is not his own people. And there are passages in Jeremiah with the same kind of, you see the same kind of lamentations over uh, Israel. Um, the passage that, uh, or the event that uh, Psalm 78 is referring to, I uh, read part of Psalm 78 at the end of last session. Uh, the, the episode that that's referring to, the rebellion of the wilderness in Numbers, the Lord a couple of times begins a statement about Israel with a how long. How long, O Israel, will I have to suffer with your rebellion? Uh, that's a lament form. And the Lord is speaking this lament form over Israel's, over Israel's sins. And then, um, if you want a New Testament equivalent to this, it's uh, like Jesus' uh, lamentation over Jerusalem at the end of uh, Matthew 23. Uh, he has spent the whole chapter condemning the scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites. He talks about Jerusalem as the city that this, that kills the prophets and those who are sent to her says that Jerusalem is going to continue in that same vein, going to continue to kill prophets, and then laments over Jerusalem for the, uh, her failure to repent uh, and uh, describes his own attitude toward Jerusalem as being like that of a mother hen that wished, wishes to gather the chicks under her wings. Uh, that's the kind of God that's revealed in the Old Testament, a God who I, I de so identifies with his people and whose life is so bound up with the life of his people that their rebellion, he doesn't, he's angry, but the anger of God in a lot of places, in the prophets especially, uh, is the anger of a, uh, of a rejected, spurned lover. Uh, could have read Isaiah 63, which uses that kind of language. Israel is supposed to be a faithful bride uh, and Israel has turned to other gods, other husbands, and the Lord speaks in the role of an offended 
husband. Uh, so this, his anger is mixed. It's an expression, really, of his love and his jealousy for Israel's attentions. Uh, so the question, again, is what, what is this God going to do? If you, if you think about some kind of God in general, uh, then incarnation looks like a, just a complete non-starter. How could, how could some simply transcendent God who has not had this dealing with Israel, how could incarnation follow from that? But if you look at this history of this God with Israel, then you can see that there's a trajectory, a pressure toward incarnation. Uh, and even though incarnation does have this kind of surprising quality to it, even though it is uh, a, an unprecedented uh, advent, the Lord comes nearer than he ever has to Israel. In fact, uh, I think it's appropriate to say that the Lord himself becomes Israel in Jesus Christ. Jesus is going to live Israel's whole history. Uh, and in order to redeem Israel, the God of Israel becomes Israel and lives out Israel's history, reversing Israel's history, recapitulating it and uh, undoing their history of sin and rebellion. That's what, uh, that's perfectly consistent, still a surprise, but it's perfectly consistent with the narrative and historical pressure that we have from the Old Testament. So in that sense too, the Old Testament is part of the story of Jesus. And in order to understand what God is doing in the incarnation, the death and resurrection of Jesus, we have to see it against the background of that, uh, of that history of God's dealings with, with his people. We can come back to that in the question and answer uh, uh, later on if you want to uh, raise questions about that. But I want to move on to uh, the actual topic for this session, uh, which I think I called, I don't have my notes in front of me, uh, verbal magic textual music. We've got a lot to cover here because this is, I started out with five lectures. Steve told me there were only four. And so instead of trying to eliminate anything, I just put two of them together into one lecture. So what I want to talk about here is, I've talked about the author of scripture, I've talked about the subject matter of scripture, which is Jesus Christ, uh, as the culmination of Israel's history. And I want to talk uh, in this session about language, um, particularly about words and how words mean and how we uh, come to understand how words work and about textual structure, uh, which I'll do under the heading of, under the metaphor of music. If you read a uh, standard textbook on hermeneutics, it will begin, near the beginning, you'll have a warning about the dangers of eisegesis. Um, eisegesis uh, can mean a number of different things, and when it means certain things, it's, it's a bad thing. Um, usually, you'll, it's, it's always a bad thing uh, when you see the term used. Uh, uh, but I see Jesus as a, um, if, you're, if it means that we import our own, our own prejudices, our own perspectives into a text and try to make a text mean what we want it to mean, um, clearly that's a, bad, that's a bad deal. You don't want to do that. Sometimes I see Jesus, though, is, is, in, is uh, explained or defined as bringing something from outside the text into the text, rather than just trying to explore what the text uh, means uh, on its own. Trying to dig in, rather, instead of digging into the text, you're exegeting, it's kind of an excavation project, you're digging into what's there. Uh, that's one process, eisegesis, is you're bringing stuff from outside uh, to bear on the text, and that's illegitimate. Uh, in the stricter sense, in the, in the first sense, again, I think eisegesis is a bad thing. We shouldn't, we shouldn't make God me say what we want him to say. Um, we should show that courtesy even uh, when we're talking about uh, texts that are written by human authors. We should show the respect to the human author that we don't try to make him say what we want him to say. We should respect what he tried to say, he or she tried to say. Uh, but particularly when we're talking about God, we don't want to force words into God's mouth. But uh, in the second sense, I think uh, I see Jesus as bringing outside information, uh, perspectives, material to bear on a text is inevitable. We can't help but do that. Uh, we can't make sense of a text at all unless we're inferring things from the words as they're written, uh, which are not expressly stated in the, in the text or unless we're bringing some kind of information from outside the text to bear on the text. Uh, I want to use a, a couple of non-biblical <coughs> examples to illustrate those, those two qualities. The first is 
to, to really read well, we have to infer things that are not expressly stated. And if we don't infer things, if we say, well, I can't know for sure that this is what the text is Im implying, uh, then we're just uh, kind of wooden, narrow readers of text rather than uh, good readers. The first example uh, is from a, a novel by Arthur Phillips called Angelica. And this is the opening paragraph of Angelica. The burst of morning sunlight started the golden dust off the enfolded crimson drapery and drew fine black veins at the edges of the walnut brown sill. The casement wants repainting, she thought. The distant irregular trills of Angelica's uncertain fingers stumbling across the piano keys downstairs. The flowery aroma of the first loaves rising from the kitchen. From within this thick foliage of domestic safety, his coiled rage found her unprepared. I'll give you one clue about what, uh, what's going on here other than what I just read, and that is that this is uh, Constance, a woman, uh, is the her or she of the paragraph. Let me read it again, and then I want to ask some questions. The burst of morning sunlight started the golden dust off the enfolded crimson drapery and drew fine black veins at the edges of the walnut brown sill. The casement wants painting, she thought. The distant irregular trills of Angelica's uncertain fingers stumbling across the piano keys downstairs the flowery aroma of the first loaves rising from the kitchen. From within this thick foliage of domestic safety, his coiled rage found her unprepared. Um, what era of time do you suspect this novel is set in? It was like 19th century. It does indeed, yes. What made you think that? It's just the images that Okay. It is, in fact, in Victorian. It's a Victorian era novel. Um, and you've already anticipated this. Um, can you try to locate this uh, Constance um, uh, socially, economically? Middle class? Middle class. <laughs> James is saying higher. Why is that? Just, it feels like there are people at work for her, or she's upstairs and right. stuff is happening, so she has stuff. Right. So she's probably. Right. What, what's that? <laughs> yes. Uh, we'll get back to Angelica in just a second. Yeah. The drapery is thick. Say again? The drapery is thick. Yeah. The drapery is thick. Um, any, anything else about that? So yeah, domestic servants, there's somebody cooking in the kitchen. Constance, I don't know who she is yet, but she's still in bed, so she's not the cook. It turns out Constance is the uh, matron of this household, so somebody is baking for her. Um, what condition is this, is this house in? Okay. The casement wants repainting, she thought. Uh, the burst of morning sunlight started the golden dust off the enfolded crimson drapery. It's golden dust, but, you know, it's dust. <laughs> Maybe those domestics are not quite as, uh, you can't get good help. Uh, you can, those domestic servants are not doing exactly what they're supposed to do. So there's a, from these opening paragraphs, you're not told this. You're not told what economic standing they have. You're not told what century it is. You find that out pretty soon within the, within the novel. But you can already start inferring some of those things from the, opening, from the opening paragraph. If you're reading carefully and recognizing that you're, uh, if, to be a good reader of this paragraph, you have to infer things that are not explicitly said. Uh, maybe uh, uh, Arthur Phillips is setting us up and this in fact is a kind of deceptive opening and he's going to tell us another kind of story in another kind of set. If he's not doing that, then he's setting us up for certain expectations uh, that he's going to make explicit as the story goes on, uh, but are already implicit here. Now, uh, what about Angelica? She can play the piano. 
But she can. Is she good at it? No. Not particularly. Her uncertain fingers are stumbling across the piano keys downstairs. If you had to guess, uh, who is Angelica? A child, right. Constance's daughter, which is right. Okay. A child who is learning to play the piano. Uh, and again, uh, her mother, Constance, is upstairs just waking up. Angelica's, uh, it must be kind of late, you know. You'd think that Angelica wouldn't start playing the piano first thing if her mother was still asleep upstairs. So Constance is waking up a little bit late, Angelica playing downstairs, and the aroma of the loaves rising from the kitchen. Um, I cite that not because it's, uh, I'm endorsing the novel particularly. I think that's a, a, a very nicely constructed paragraph, and I think it's also one that illustrates the fact that there's uh, any good reading uh, is going to involve trying to tease out things from the text that are not ex explicitly stated uh, uh, in order to enrich and deepen what we're getting from it. The second illustration I want to take as uh, non, uh, the non-biblical illustration is not so much about inferring things, teasing them out of the text, as recognizing that to get the full impact of something, we need to bring information and uh, uh, and uh, uh, other, we have to bring other things from outside to bear. Uh, this is a poem by Alexander Pushkin called The Prophet. I'll read it in English instead of Russian. <laughs> Partly because I can't read Russian. Uh, I, don't know the, I don't know anything about the quality of the translation here. <clears throat> this is Alexander Pushkin, The Prophet. With fainting heart, sorry, with fainting soul, a thirst for grace, I wandered in a desert place, and at the crossing of the ways, I saw a sixfold seraph blaze. He touched mine eyes with fingers light as sleep that cometh in the night, and like a frightened eagle's eyes, they opened wide with prophecies. He touched mine ears, and they were drowned with tumult and a roaring sound. I heard convulsion in the sky, and flight of angel hosts on high and beasts that move beneath the sea, and the sap creeping in the tree. And bending to my mouth, he wrung from out of it my sinful tongue, with all its lies and idle rust, and twixt my lips a perishing, a subtle serpent's forked, forked sting, with right hand wet with blood he thrust. And with his sword my breast he cleft, my quaking heart thereout he reft, and in the yawning of my breast, a coal of living fire he pressed. Then in the desert I lay dead, and God called unto me and said, Arise, and let my voice be heard. Charged with my will, go forth and span the land and sea, and let my word lay waste with fire the heart of man. Uh, I can read that again if you want to hear it again. Would you like to hear it again? Okay. This is uh, The Prophet by Alexander Pushkin. With fainting soul, a thirst for grace, I wandered in a desert place, and at the crossing of the ways I saw a sixfold seraph blaze. He touched mine eyes with fingers light as sleep that cometh in the night, and like a frightened eagle's eyes they opened wide with prophecies. He touched mine ears and they were drowned with tumult and a roaring sound. I heard convulsion in the sky and flight of angel hosts on high and beasts that move beneath the sea, and the sap creeping in the tree. And bending to my mouth, he wrung from out of it my sinful tongue, and all its lies and idle rust, and twixt my lips a perishing, a subtle serpent's forked sting, with right hand wet with blood he thrust. And with his sword my breast he cleft, my quaking heart thereof, thereout he reft, and in the yawning of my breast a coal of living fire he pressed. Then in the desert I lay dead, and God called unto me and said, Arise, and let my voice be heard. Charged with my will, go forth and span the land and sea, and let my word lay waste with fire the heart of man. Um, any uh, sense of what, uh, what it's about without, before we start thinking about what, might, what other texts and events might be alluded to? <clears throat> It's Alexander Pushkin, the, uh, the poet of Russian literature. 
I'm sorry? Okay, Isaiah, right. Isaiah 6, you're getting that from the sixfold seraph blaze. He's getting a new mouth so that he can speak with fire. Right, there's an Isaiah 6. Uh, re- there are Isaiah 6 references throughout the whole, throughout the whole uh, passage. What, what do you think for Pushkin, what is this describing? Probably not describing, it's not autobiographical, but it's a symbolic description of what? Right. So he sees his poetry as a kind of divine inspiration, as a kind of uh, as a kind of prophecy. Um, what about? Yeah? Well, the thing is, it is a tale of conversion. Okay. Right. Yeah. And I think there's a reference to Philippians when it says of convulsion in the heavens, things moved above the earth, and the earth and the earth. There's a three part. Didn't quite match. <laughs> Uh-huh. Hmm. Right. Yep. And part of it, part of the convulsion, the convulsion in the sky is something that he hears once uh, he's had his, he has his eyes and his ears touched, and then he's given a new tongue. <clears throat> so I suspect that there's some allusions to gospel healings that he's being equipped to hear things that nobody else can hear, and then to say things that. Uh, are effective. He's given um, a, a, a subtle serpent's fork and sting in his mouth uh, in place of his tongue, which is an interesting kind of conversion to get a serpent's tongue in place of a human tongue. And he's given a heart of fire. So when he speaks now, uh, he can speak a fire that uh, lays waste uh, the, the heart of man. Yeah? Is it a Russian Orthodox uh, probably there probably is, would be a, an orthodox allusion. I don't I don't know what exactly it would be. I was thinking more Isaiah six. I mean the um, that song of the seraphs plays a role in the orthodox liturgy. So uh, there may be a specific reference to some kind of orthodox initiation. Okay. Uh, we could go on with that. I, I think that's a quite a quite a wonderful uh, poem about. Poetic, poetic and prophetic inspiration. Well, the, we, we've said enough to make the point that we're, we're filling out our grasp of the poem and our sense of what the poem is about by bringing things from outside of the poem. Isaiah 6, he doesn't say exactly that. He doesn't quote exactly from it. But what the poem means uh, is partly a matter of bringing in that. Well, a good reader is somebody who can bring the right information, the right outside information to bear on uh, that poem. Uh, I've, I've compared this in my book on hermeneutics, Deep Ex of Jesus, uh, to, uh, the, uh, to uh, a, text or, uh, a text is a joke, is, is the title of one chapter. In order to grasp a joke, you can't, uh, usually the information you need to, to get the joke is not there in the, uh, not there in, in the text uh, of the joke, in the words of the joke. You have to have some information, and have the, you have to have some information from outside, and have some enough wit to know what information is relevant to the joke that you're hearing. I, I realized this. I use this illustration in my book. I realized this when my kids came to me one time with a joke from the Reader's Digest, um, and it was, this was the joke: uh, a priest, a rabbi, and a preacher go into bar, and the bartender says, "What is this a joke?" <laughs> And my kids said, they brought it and read it to us because they thought it might be funny. But then they said, ah, I don't understand that. <laughs> what does that mean? They, they didn't know about this tradition of joke telling that involves religious characters gathered together in public houses <laughs> or on the street or wherever. But they, they needed to have information from outside the joke itself in order to even make literal sense of the joke. It just made no sense to them. They could read each word, but nothing clicked for them unless they had this outside information. That wasn't a matter of embellishing what they were reading. It wasn't that they needed some other texts and knowledge of this joke tradition in order to make sense, to, to fill out their understanding. They didn't understand it at all without that outside information. I think we're always in that situation where we have to have, both with scripture and with other texts, we have to bring information from outside of the text in order to understand the text. And certainly to understand the fullness of the text, we have to have things that uh, 
we have to recognize connections between texts. We have to recognize that there are there's other uh, information, other realities that are being brought uh, brought into play without being directly stated. We can talk about uh, a lexical setting for every word is a word that is part of a sorry a part of a a, a, a set of vocabulary in a particular language, and that word means what it does in relation to other words in that language, and we can't understand the words that we're reading unless we have some sense of that uh, lexical context. We can't understand the words on the page unless we have some kind of, some recognition of a literary context, uh, the, the, the context of the surrounding words, uh, and then we also often have to have a, uh, a context in life. Uh, to understand what a particular word means, we have to know what setting, in what life setting it's being uttered or being, being written. Uh, and if we don't have that, then uh, it's, uh, it still has meaning, but we don't know uh, exactly what it means. It remains ambiguous. So by talking about uh, what I'm talking about in talking about um, a kind of eisegesis, that is bringing things from outside to bear on the text, or trying to infer things from inside the text that aren't expressly stated, uh, I'm basically talking about what, uh, uh, what goes, what, what I'm basically talking about context. Um, we have to read... Uh, every text uh, in context of other texts. We have to read every word and sentence of a text in the context of other words and sentences in the text. And context has a kind of magical quality, I think. Context, on the one hand, uh, imprisons meaning, specifies meaning, makes meaning the meaning of a word or a sentence precise, and without the context, we don't get the precise meaning of a word. At the same time, context liberates meaning. It both restricts what the word or sentence means. At the same time, the same phenomenon, the same context can liberate a word to give us uh, new kinds of insights and meanings and open up a fullness of meaning. Context gives us both precision and fullness of meaning. Well, let me, let me expand on that a little bit. What do, what do I mean by saying that context imprisons meaning or gives us a sense of precision? Um, if I say the word fire, what do I mean? Well, there's, what's that? It could be, yes. Uh, it it uh, may conjure up a flame. That may be the first meaning that came to mind. Uh, you might have thought of a uh, firing squad, and I've just uh, ordered somebody to shoot. That's the classic example of uh, speech that's not covered by the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. You can't yell the word fire in a crowded theater because it puts other people in danger. Uh, unless there is a fire, then you can yell it. But if you just yell fire when there's no fire, you're just putting people in danger unnecessarily, and that's not protected speech. Um, I could be warning, it could be a warning. My uh, grandson is toddling over to the fire pit and I point at the fire, that is, don't touch. But without those, uh, th those settings in life, or if you're looking at a text, a setting within the text, uh, the word itself is ambiguous, it's underdetermined. You don't know, you don't know what exactly it means. It's not meaningless. I say fire and I don't mean uh, honeybee. It's not the same word. But it doesn't have very determined meaning unless you look at the surrounding context. And of course, words and sentences in the Bible, uh, the Bible is written in human language and words and sentences in the Bible have the same kind of uh, phenomenon in order to, in order to uh, understand the specific precise meaning of a term. You have to look at it in its literary context and uh, figure out what it means. For example, uh, Leviticus 15 um, uses the word flesh, uh, talks about there are, um, uh, there are flows from the flesh that defile people. Leviticus 15 is a passage about uh, defiling issues and the various rites of washing and cleansing that you use in order to get clean again after you've been defiled. Um, Flesh by itself seems like it could mean what well, could mean a lot of different things. I've referred to the word flesh already today. Uh, flesh could mean uh, 
muscles and uh, the, the, the part of your body between your skeleton and your skin, basically. Um, it could refer to uh, specific parts of your body. In some contexts, flesh uh, refers to uh, the uh, evanescence and weakness of life. Uh, all flesh is as grass. That's not just talking about the musculature of your body, it's talking about the human condition that you are as uh, fragile and uh, temporal as grass that uh, grows up and that's cut down and burned. Um, but in Leviticus 15, as you look at the, uh, the context and the particular rules, you realize that flesh has a very specific connotation and it refers to sexual organs. And only those flows from sexual organs, a woman in her menstruation, a man who's having a flow from his uh, sexual organ, that, would, that defiles. It's not, you cut your arm and you begin to bleed, that's a flow from flesh in one sense, but that doesn't defile you. It's only the sexual organs and flows from the sexual organs that are in view. And you, you re realize that when you read on and look at the context. It's flesh in the same sense that flesh is used in connection with circumcision. Circumcision is a mark in the flesh. It's not a mark in uh, your arm. Uh, it's a mark in a particular part of your flesh. So that's, a, that's a, one of uh, you know, a millions of examples we could use of how uh, a, in the biblical text to give a precise meaning to a word, you need to have more of the surrounding context. The more magical thing, I think, is the way that uh, surrounding context can also liberate certain meanings that you wouldn't have recognized or wouldn't be your first thought when you, hear, uh, when you hear a word or when you read a word. You put a word in a surprising context and certain, certain aspects of the meaning come up to the front of the stage that might have been in the back of the stage when you first heard the word. Uh, there's certain, uh, there, there's a layers of significance or layers of meaning in a particular word uh, and uh, putting it together with other words uh, brings out uh, various dimensions of it. I want to, uh, a line from a poem, uh, I'll just read, not, not in order, but I'll read a word at a time and give you a moment to think about uh, what kind of connotations the word has. And then how those connotations shift as I add words, as I uh, put it in more context. Robin. Robin. Robin's eggshell. Robin's eggshell fine. The day is Robin's eggshell fine. Okay, do that again. We can talk a little bit about each moment of that. I think that's a lovely line. Robin. Probably thought bird. Did you? <laughs> Anybody think Batman's side? <laughs> admit it. Admit it. <laughs> but um, even saying that much, uh, it's not a hawk. It's not a crow or a rook. It's a robin. That has certain connotations that go beyond just the word itself. It's identifying a particular kind of bird, but it's, we know that robins are, at least in my part of the world, are harbingers of spring. When robins show up, then you know that spring is around the corner. Um, and uh, it would have a certain connotation of uh, freshness, new life. But then robin's eggshell, let me add the next word, robin's eggshell, fine. Robin is a noun, eggshell is a noun, Robin's eggshell is a noun with a modifying, but then you put fine at the end and Robin's eggshell becomes a, uh, a modifier of the adjective fine. Robin's eggshell would connote color perhaps, perhaps a certain uh, delicacy. When you put fine on the end of it, then the aspect of delicacy and um, fragility, perhaps, but also beauty, and maybe still color, right? Robin's eggshells are blue, aren't they? <laughs> like sky blue, okay? So Robin's eggshell, fine, you're getting a hint of color in there, even though it doesn't actually mention the color. 
And your, uh, the robin itself connotes a, a kind of springtime when you add the word fine. And then especially when you get the whole sentence, the day is robin's eggshell fine. Then you have a striking new way of, uh, you haven't thought about days being compared to robin's eggshells before, I suppose. You haven't thought of robin's eggshell as a, one of the gradations of fineness. That's a, new, that's a new way of thinking about it. That's a new way of thinking about delicacy and, um, uh, and, uh, and perfection and, and beauty. Uh, and it's a new way of thinking about a day. Uh, yeah, a day, the day is fine. The blue sky is fine. The sky is very blue. You might even say the sky is Robin's eggshell blue. But then the whole day is Robin's eggshell fine. You put those into new context and suddenly you have this whole set of connotations that are flowering from those words. Uh, that you would have gotten from each word uh, in isolation. Uh, and it's the juxtaposition of these words in a surprising way that gives you this uh, effect that you wouldn't have had in other, uh, in other uh, circumstances, other texts. Uh, let me read the whole poem just for the sake of, it's short, for the sake of completeness. I took a screenshot of it here. This is a, po a poem I came across uh, from the uh, poetry magazine. Uh, it's, uh, uh, I don't have the title here. It's something about, uh, I think it's called Lake Ontario Park. It's by Sadika de Major, M E I J E R, Mayor probably. Sadika is S A D I Q A. Uh, you can find the poem at uh, Poetry Foundation, uh, which is the uh, website of Poetry Magazine. Here's the whole poem. Over the warming ground, swings toll like clock, like clock tower bells. Squirrels spiral the tr trunk of a pine. Let me start over, I was, I'm mangling this. Over the warming ground, swings toll like clock tower bells. Squirrels spiral the trunk of a pine. We fill a pail with sand. The day is Robin's eggshell fine. My mother's shoulder had three shallow scars, shining archipelago. The quiet theaters of our lives, immune is a sun word, skirting sorrow. Kneeling at no registry of toddlers with amorphous voices, night sweats without monument. The lake has the sea on its breath. One man has an island. Can't say I understand the rest of that poem. But I was arrested by the one line about the day being fine. <laughs> I thought I should read it just to put it in a particular context. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to stop there, going to pause there and pick up the rest of what I wanted to say in this lecture uh, in the next session. But um, I'll stop and ask if there are any questions about what I've been talking about. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Yeah. Um, uh, the question is, uh, um, I've been talking mainly about how meaning emerges when you put words and sentences and speech acts into literary settings, textual settings. Uh, what, uh, what can we say about words, the biblical uh, words and biblical texts, biblical reading and preaching that, uh, uh, and how, the, how it takes on meaning in, in life contexts? Um, there, there's uh, several thoughts come to mind. Um, one is a more biblically, a more biblically oriented thought, um, and I'll use uh, use Jesus. Um, could use any number of examples from the life of Jesus, uh, where he does something on the Sabbath day that rouses the uh, opposition and ire of the Pharisees. Um, I I don't think. Jesus ever violates the Sabbath. I don't think Jesus ever qualifies the Sabbath. I don't think Jesus is making up loopholes in Sabbath keeping. 
I think what Jesus is doing is showing how Sabbath keeping uh, should work. Uh, The Sabbath laws themselves are framed as commandments not only to take rest, but to give rest. Uh, Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it, you shall not do any work. You nor your son or your daughter, your manservant, your maidservant, your ox or your ass, (laughs) uh, or anything that is your neighbor's. Uh, no, I, got, I mixed that up with the last one. Um, anyway, every, every person and animal in the house gets a rest on the Sabbath day. If you're head of the household, you're supposed to be giving rest as much as taking it. And so when Jesus says, you know, don't, you, you pull out the ox from the ditch, he's not saying, well, in really extreme cases, you can break the Sabbath. Uh, and no, he's saying an ox in a ditch is not enjoying Sabbath. And you need to make sure that your ox enjoys Sabbath because that's part of the commandment. So that's an, those are actions and words of Jesus. Not, it's, sometimes it's actions, Jesus doing things on the Sabbath day, which is a proper interpretation of the Sabbath command um, that, uh, that shocks the Pharisees, gives, uh, to, to put it in terms of you ask the question, kind of gives a new, which is I think the original, but gives a new meaning to the Sabbath command by the way he obeys it, by his action. Uh, so that would be one one angle on it that, uh, uh, and I, I, more generally, that's an that's a example from scripture, but I think more generally, I'm gonna comment on this in the last session a little bit. Um, but I think our, our responses to scripture are interpretations of scripture. Our responses to scripture when, uh, you know, uh, Jesus says, follow me, take up your cross and follow me. And in particular circumstances, we obey that commandment. Uh, and uh, shoulder whatever suffering, whatever trial that the Lord has given us. Uh, that is a, gives us, uh, that's, a, that's a fresh interpretation of the commandment that gives, is a context that helps us to deepen our understanding of what the text is saying. Uh, so you, know, you can think about this more historically. There are certain things that uh, are in Scripture, they're permanently in Scripture, but uh, we may not have known the fullness of what they meant until certain circumstances came up and they're, now we have to address that circumstance from these scriptures and suddenly we see something about the text that we hadn't realized before. It means this too. It has this implication. What is periphrasis? Oh, <laughs> did I get that in there? Oh, <laughs> yeah. It just slips in no matter what I'm talking about. Um, Perichoresis is the technical name for um, a uh, reality within the life of the Trinity that Jesus describes in John, particularly in John's gospel, when he talks about uh, John 17, especially. uh, I am in the Father, the Father is in me. Um, John 14, I read a little bit this morning, and he says that uh, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Don't you believe, Philip, that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Uh, that's a, the, the mutual indwelling of uh, father and son is what te- theologians use the, use the word perichoresis to describe that. And I was suggesting, I didn't really develop that point, but um, um, that, uh, let me say some, something briefly about uh, letter A since I didn't really talk about it. Um, uh, sometimes uh, the, we think of language as presenting a kind of picture of the world. And in some ways that does, it, it, it uh, is a way of describing reality. But if, if we, we can get into problems if we think of the uh, language as being, uh, uh, being outside the world looking in as it were, and, and something that's not in the world that describes the world that is outside itself. Uh, obviously language is a phenomenon that takes place within uh, history, within creation. Uh, and so language is part of the way the world works, the way humanity relates, one of the central ways that we relate to one another is through language. So language operates in the world. At the same time, the world, and uh, you can th- think of historical events, historical personages that begin to inhabit language. Uh, in the US, I don't know if it's spilled over to the UK, every political scandal in the US now gets the suffix gate, no matter what it is, uh, because of Watergate back in the 70s. Uh, the, the Watergate break-in that eventually ended with the, the resignation of Richard Nixon as president. But, you know, uh, Trump has had, I don't know, 15 different gate scandals. Uh, you know, Stormy Gate, uh, Comey Gate, everything gets that little suffix. 
Uh, that's, a, that's a contingent historical event that's now lodged itself in our language, and it's become part of, our, part of the way we describe the world. Um, so the world comes into language, historical events get worked into our language, uh, and language operates in the world, and I'm, I was suggesting that there's a kind of image of perichoresis in that mutual indwelling of language in the world. This is the perichoresis gesture. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Sorry, um, apologies if it's something you covered this morning as I wasn't able to be here, so we can take several of it is. But you said something along the lines of the exact way I'm not sure about it, something about teasing out what's not specified in the text. Yeah. And I was just, I, so I, I think I know what you mean by that, but I was just trying to think through the sort of teaching angle of that. So if mm. you come across something in, in study that you think, oh, that's encouraging. That you you can't say I'm absolutely sure about that because it's something you think is not specified in the text. Yeah. But you think it's helpful for the meaning. Would, would you teach that? And if so, would you would you put a disclaimer on it as well? Yeah. Uh, the question is, uh, what about um, inferring things from the text that are not explicitly stated, uh, and particular in particular, uh, how how would you go about teaching that uh, if uh, if, you're, if it's an inference and you're not absolutely certain that it's the right inference. Um, well, I think there would certainly be cases where I would um, specify that, it, it depends on the setting, in a, in a certain kind of setting, uh, I feel more liberty to speculate on what the text might imply uh, in a more kind of academics setting, I, I would do that. If I'm preaching, I probably wouldn't even mention things that I'm uh, that are kind of extrapolations from the text itself, and if I did, yeah, I would. Uh, I try to make a distinction between what I'm, what it, what is actually being said and what's implied. But at the same time, the, the Westminster Confession, I think, has is onto something uh, when it says that there is such a thing as good and necessary uh, uh, implication or good and necessary deductions from Scripture, and that those have the same authority good as necessary. good and necessary consequences. consequences. Sorry, good and necessary consequences from scripture. So um, yeah, I use the word deduction, which made it too sound like it's too much of a logical deduction. So there are things that are stated in scripture. Uh, I, should, I should say there are things unstated in scripture that are imp so strongly implied by scripture that they still are, uh, have uh, the authority of scripture. Um, you couldn't say, uh, uh, I suppose this is a this, this, I suppose, would be controversial, probably not in this setting, but in other settings. Um, scripture doesn't explicitly uh, condemn abortion. There are, there are passages that you can say imply a condemnation of abortion. Uh, it doesn't explicitly condemn that, but it does condemn murder. And um, I think you can in reason from that, uh, that uh, prohibition of murder, that an attack on an unborn child is uh, is a form of murder and should be uh, should be treated as such. So that's not that's would be a more uh, that'd be a moral implication. That's not, and I would see that as a good and necessary consequence of what Scripture says. So I, I don't think we're uh, uh, I don't think we're strictly limited to saying just just the words that are actually on the page of Scripture. There are things that that implies. But there are degrees of which it implies, you know, degrees of strength. Some, some are uh, very strongly implied, so strongly that you can say, uh, this, this is also, uh, you know, this, this commandment still applies directly here. Uh, there are other things that are more speculative, and, and in that case, yeah, I'd, I'd want to be careful to distinguish the two. Yeah. So, um, so everyone isogetes some way, whether or not they want to or intend to, um, but someone's eisegesis will be better than someone else's. So yes. With the scriptures of theology, that would be a Western theologian will eisegete differently to a theologian from the majority world. Um, who Specific, specific example, but how do you weigh up where someone is better or more fairly than someone else? Yeah, the question is, um, 
if uh, if it's a fa if it's the case that everyone isogees to one degree or another, uh, how, uh, everyone's going to do that differently, and particularly when you have cultural differences um, between uh, a Western a Western reader of scripture and a majority world reader of scripture, who's going to negotiate uh, the weight that's given to one or the other? Um, just to just to clarify what I'm what I'm saying and not saying uh, when I say. Um, <laughs> When I say eisegesis is inevitable, I'm defining eisegesis at that point in terms of trying to bring in things from outside scriptures to bear on the scriptures. I think we can't help but do that. Or to bring other texts to bear on specific texts. I think that's not only inevitable, but it's necessary and a good, a good practice. Uh, I don't think it's uh, good to, again, as I said, to try to um, force the words of scripture to mean what we say. That's, I know that's not what you're saying, but I just wanted to make sure that that's, that's clear. Um, so uh, wh what, I what I would understand the phenomenon that you're, that you're talking about is, um, and maybe, maybe you have something else in mind, but so let me know if, if you do. Um, a, uh, an African Christian reading a particular text in scripture will come to that with a certain set of experiences and questions that simply don't occur to a Western reader. And therefore, he's going to uh, highlight things, notice things, give particular emphases to things that uh, a Western reader wouldn't. Um, if that's the kind of thing you're talking about, then in, in many cases, I would see that as an enrichment of Scripture for everyone. Uh, it's a... Because uh, the, the, the uh, African Christian is noticing, and so far as he's noticing and reasoning about the text and things that are actually, God has actually said, um, that would be an edifying thing for the rest of the world to know if it's, uh, or if it's something that, you know, Westerners have taken certain themes and kind of sidelined them, um, and they just pop out to uh, a, uh, a majority world reader. Uh, that's something that Western readers can, can, uh, can learn. So insofar, it's, insofar as it's uh, bringing your own experience and set of questions to the text, letting those questions be interrogated by the text, as well as being a, a set of questions you're bringing there, uh, I think it can be edifying and enriching for the whole, for the whole church. Um, I, I guess I go back to the kind of comment I was making at the end of the session this morning. I, I, I don't know that there's a way to, uh, there's, there's not a way to put it this way, there's not a way to short circuit the process of, of sorting through, debating through, praying and discussing through differences of reading, uh, differences of, of interpretation. I don't think there's a, a set of prior guidelines or rules that can, uh, that can d make those decisions for us. And so the question is, if you have a, um, a, a certain standard kind of traditional reading in the West that is, uh, in, in, or in not just the West, but in the Christian tradition, that's being challenged from another part of the world that has just received the Bible afresh. Um, that may be a correction that the uh, Christian tradition needs to hear. And there's no way to know that in, unless you do the work of sorting through it. Uh, um, that, that, hope that got at the question you're asking. Yeah, I think one last one before we break. As, as a woman having to try and speak to younger women, Bible in Genesis. Mm -hmm. So if Adam points to the second Adam and the Christ, mm -hmm. is it right to make, with feminism being one of the big enemies, I think, mm -hmm. to what's going on to Christianity, is it right as a woman to look at Eve, therefore, pointing um, either towards the New Jerusalem, so through the church to the New Jerusalem, through the faithful women um, leading to that, and or be pointing to the women of Holly, unfaithful Jerusalem, to the harlot mm. um, who is drinking the blood of the saints mm -hmm. and the martyrs and the squashing of blood within the midst of Jerusalem, pointing mm. to abortion mm. and all these other sort of symbols. Am I getting the right idea or am I? Yeah, uh, the, uh, I'd have to, I'd have to, I'd have to clarify what you said at the end, but the, the overall the overall scope that you were talking about, yeah, uh, this is this is a patristic truism almost, 
that um, Adam is uh, the, uh, Adam is put into a deep sleep, rib taken out, Eve made from Adam. Connecting that scene in Genesis 2 with the piercing of Jesus' side in John 19 uh, and blood and water flowing. Um, that being, uh, for patristic readers, uh, baptism and the blood of the Eucharist that are forming the new Eve, which is the church. What's that? Patristic, early, the early church, the church fathers. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a standard reading of the, the scene at the cross. That Jesus. There's a splitting throughout the Bible. Right. Beginning with Adam and Eve. And yeah. it's like the recovery program. Right. And in the same way, wrinkle means sort of a splitting that needs covering over. So what, what, what represents our old age is also the recovery program. Hmm. So linking all those different things. Yeah, again, I'd, I'd have to explore more what you're saying at the end there. I, the, the, again, the, the overall pattern you're thinking about, it, I think, is right. That uh, Adam uh, is uh, one, one individual being. He's made into two, and they're to become one flesh. Yeah. That's the pattern of sacrifice. An animal is dismembered and reunited in smoke. Yeah. It's the pattern of Israel that's separated into north and south and reunited <coughs> in exile. Um, I think it's the, it's the pattern of Jesus' death uh, in various dimensions. He's separated from his disciples and reunited in the resurrection. So you can make broad sweeps like that. Yeah, that, so I, yeah oh, I, right, word. yeah. Okay. But I think the typology is, yeah, the, the typology you mentioned at the beginning, that Eve is a type of the church. Um, the last Adam also has a bride, and that is the church and ultimately the New Jerusalem. I, that's, I think that's exactly right, yes.